Hey everybody, welcome to Madden Science. We're doing another AP Environmental Science flipped classroom lesson. This time it's on Unit 4, Earth Systems and Resources. We're doing three sections, so three and nine sections, four, 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 seven, four, five. What sections are those, you ask? Well, here you go. We're going to be in on 4.4, Earth's atmosphere. Then we're going to jump to 4.7, solar radiation and earth seasons and then that's going to feed us back into 4.5 global wind pattern so really on the atmosphere and weather portions of unit four you can see some lists and here we are on atmosphere don't forget flipped lesson rules and ideas notes drawings have your book open write down some questions including two specific ones and then throw in your comment the rules don't forget your time stamp we got from our apes guidelines some ideas again here are our sections atmosphere solar radiation and global wind patterns so these things touch on many other parts of the year we're going to focus on them in this lecture mainly on the uh, atmosphere portion Here's some ideas for activities. 4.4 covered really in two different sections. We've got it shown here. We're covering major gases and what's up with the atmosphere. Here's the vocab that you'll see. Again, those objectives are seen here. Structure and composition of the atmosphere broken into really two parts. We're going to do actually second one first. So layers of the atmosphere, what's up with that, and major gases. So the atmosphere, it's a mixture of gases, known as air, protects life on Earth by absorbing ultraviolet radiation and reducing temperature extremes between day and night. Keeping in mind the atmosphere is not static. Interactions involving the amount of sunlight, the spin of the planet, and tilt are going to cause ever-changing atmospheric conditions. They're going to play out in nearly every aspect of environmental science. Here's your general picture. Shows from Earth and its crust all the way out to outer space. Obviously, this isn't to scale, right? That layer of atmosphere, layer of air, is really, really tiny in comparison to the Earth itself. Right, just a thin envelope, a thin outer skin on Earth. Um, first up, you got troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere. Note that there's some um, breaks in between. There's a super important layer within the stratosphere called the ozone layer, so a high concentration of ozone that exists in it about 20 to 30 kilometers. We'll see that ozone exists elsewhere. It's just concentrated or at its peak in that layer. See from beginning to end or inside to out. Again, some general markers in terms of distance and therefore thickness. Uh, this figure I like a lot. It not only shows on the y-axis the distance or height of that layer, it also shows temperatures which is interesting, right? Here's what we normally experience, right? So you're climbing Mount Everest, the temperature would be going down. So down as you go up, and then in the stratosphere, somewhat the same, but increases slightly. Mesosphere dips, and as you might expect, in the thermosphere, you have an increase in temperature. Here's another view that shows a similar view, but it also shows idea of the layers and the distinctions between layers. Shown here, tropopause, stratopause, and mesopause. You got your average pressure at these different spots. You can see it in millibars. You got layers and the layer boundaries shown here. And then over here you've got the layer names themselves. So again, boundaries on the left, and then layers Oops, Mark is a little bit fat on that one. That's okay. So up from troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere. And most important thing to note on this is that all of our weather is happening within the troposphere. 
Note too that they've got interesting connection here with the Aurora. Here's a beautiful picture from Paul Nicklin or have a look at this video. Now, the atmosphere protects us not just in thermal ways and with UV radiation, but you also see here with X-rays and extreme UV and ultraviolet, obviously visible light and infrared are going to make it all the way down and even helps protect us from charged particles. So really vital in the evolution of life on Earth. So this thin layer, without it, life would likely not exist or certainly wouldn't exist as we know it. I mentioned earlier concentration of ozone. So you can see it changing as we move up from troposphere to stratosphere. And the concentration, yeah, really it's in between 20 and 30 kilometers. So ozone concentration here in millipascals. So what is the Earth's atmosphere? made of, right? What is air? Well, it's generally kind of close to four-fifths nitrogen and one-fifth oxygen, but a little more complicated than that. If you broke it down pie chart, you got nitrogen hanging out at 78%, oxygen just under 21%, and this is going to change slightly by location and definitely with increase in altitude. Argon in third place, and then you get broken down a little bit further, right at 0.05%, including pretty important gas related to global warming and greenhouse gases, uh, carbon dioxide. Interesting math there at 0.0407%. That equals 407 parts per million. So when you hear parts per million, that's what they're talking about. Speaking of weather, it's getting quite a bit darker outside. Hopefully you can still see me. And if the pie chart isn't good enough, take a look at this chart, which shows them, again, by percentage, and then as you get lower in parts per million. This shows it as blocks. Here's a really cool app from HHMI Biointeractive, which is going to show well, let's look at it. Close this guy out. You can go back and take a look at the Earth through time. This will put it all together. And you can go from Pangea all the way up to modern day. You can also look at ice ages through time. Probably more concerned with ice age in North America. And then probably most interestingly, at least for our studies right now, you can add chart on here and look at changes in temperature, changes in oxygen, again to present day 21 percent, changes in carbon dioxide, again a big old tick up right here, day length, luminosity, and biodiversity if you like. Here's another view just on the evolutionary significance of Earth's atmosphere prebiotic and then post. It shows significantly carbon dioxide level and measuring in at least for 2018 at 407.4 parts per million. Here's a cycling from Mauna Loa, the observatory in Hawaii, and then 4.7, so solar radiation and Earth seasons. Got some key terms right here some important and helpful learning objectives can be shown here too. So Earth-Sun, energy affects Earth's surface. Classic diagrams can be seen here and here. So this shows that the directness of solar radiation, the sunlight, determines the energy. So sunlight directly overhead, you can see that there's a greater amount of sunlight per unit surface area. So even if you wrote it kind of like, you know, energy per kilometer squared, in the case of the poles, as you move away from the equator, you're going to find that there's the same amount of energy coming in, right? You can see just the three rays. But this one covers a much greater area. So this 
area as shown here is much bigger than at the equator and therefore the same energy over a much bigger area means a lower unit or per unit area energy. Now this diagram is going to show you seasonality. So it's important to note that if you go back, if the earth was flat or if it didn't have a tilt, you'd have different relationships shown. Can you hear that rain coming down? Uh, quite a storm out there. This one shows that as the earth spins around the sun, you get changes in seasons. So that tilt shown here, it's not straight or flat, but it's at 23.5 degrees, which gives rise to our changes in seasons, right? Where you got equal day and night for equinoxes, for spring and autumn, and then for winter and summer solstice, or really December and June, which in our case in Northern Hemisphere is going to be winter and summer. This shows you again those learning objectives. So incoming solar radiation or insulation is our main source of energy. It's dependent on seasons and latitude. The angle of the sun rays or the sun's rays determine the intensity. Highest solar radiation per unit area is at the equator. Solar radiation received at location on the Earth's surface very seasonally. Again, that's what we're seeing here. And the tilt is highly important and causes the Earth's season and number of daylight hours. So as the school year goes on, certainly in the first half, it's getting darker earlier and it's getting lighter later for us. See here, this is going to impact weather systems too, as at the equator, high energy is going to create higher temperatures and that hot moist air rises, condenses, some of that heat is lost to outer space and as it cools and dries, it circles back around. So seasonally, here are just some figures that show different angles and their effect on the Earth and seasons. Again, flip-flopped for North versus South, or Northern Hemisphere versus Southern Hemisphere. And a good view, and you can imagine yourself at any of these locations at different latitudes. This is the sun and its location overhead at different dates around the year. All right, global wind patterns. So how is it that these ideas and concept impact global wind patterns, and specifically the Coriolis effect? So we're looking here, how does environmental factors or how they can result in atmospheric circulation? And then global wind, primarily the result of most intense solar radiation at the equator. So one of my favorite apps or websites is going to be windy.com, shown here. We can also take a really cool look at pressure systems around the globe. Or my favorite weatherman, my favorite wind commercial. All right, so the movement of air is going to depend on a number of things, mainly the heating of the Earth from the sun, and the fact that the Earth is spinning. So the air of the atmosphere moves in response to the heating from the sun. Circulation in the atmosphere transport warmth from the equator to higher latitudes, which then cools. And the rotation of the Earth can cause these movements to break up into three distinct cells. Again, three on the northern hemisphere, three on the southern hemisphere. This shows it a little bit more clearly. You can see that the red line is the hot air moving and rising, condensing into clouds and precipitation, and then cools and cooler dry air falls down. This is much of what we saw earlier in hot moist air, condensation, precipitation, cooled, warm and dry, and then cycles back around. So this pattern shown here, again, elevating and then cycling back down, we get the opposite here with the feral cell and then the polar cell. And this is flip-flopped or reciprocal on the southern hemisphere. The Coriolis effect gives rise to a mass moving in a rotating system that experiences a force acting perpendicular to the direction of motion and to the axis of rotation. 
right? So on Earth, this is going to tend towards deflecting things to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. It shows you clearly here. So energy from the sun is distributed through a global system. Heated air moves towards the poles, and then friction, drag, momentum cause air close to the Earth's surface to be pulled in a direction similar to the rotation. So because the Earth is bigger at the equator, it's actually moving faster than air up higher or at a higher latitude. So what you see here is a difference in these vectors, right? Vector getting smaller as you move up, and because of that, what would normally be straight up motion ends up being deflected to the right versus down here. And that's going to cause cyclones or hurricanes in the northern hemisphere to spin counterclockwise and cyclones in the southern hemisphere to rotate clockwise. Again, you can see this based on here's the equator and rotation of the Earth. Air is moving faster at the equator and slower towards the poles. And the deflection ends up being in that same direction. Oops. Which can be seen here and seen here for the Coriolis effect. Now this, again, has major impact. If you look, northern hemisphere, counterclockwise, southern hemisphere, clockwise. There's much better resources online that you can check out. I'll put links in the bottom, specifically Derek Muller and Veritasium and Smarter Every Day did a really cool side-by-side -side northern and southern hemisphere comparison. And they showed that this works on large fluids, but it does not work on your toilet. It's too small. So the spiraling in one direction or the other in your toilet is not due to the Coriolis effect, but instead just the dynamics and shape of your toilet bowl. All right, that's it. Here again are your objectives. Take a look back through and see if we've met those and if you understand them. If not, ask some questions in class or in the comments. Here are sections again, and don't forget your comment below. Let me know if you got any questions, everybody. Thanks and take care.